guys, welcome back to In Case of Econ Struggles, welcome to another micro struggle. Today I'm talking about second order stochastic dominance or SOSD. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what it means to be a mean preserving spread. So timestamps are below, but let's just quickly go over what I want to do in this video and then we'll get right into it. So like I said, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about SOSD. Very similar to some of my other videos, we're going to start with an example so that you start to get the feel for what we're going to do. And then we'll start getting into graphically and analytically determining SOSD. We'll talk exactly what conditions we need in order to use SOSD. And then I'll talk a little more about a mean preserving spread, how you can sort of determine if a lottery is a mean preserving spread of another lottery. So again, timestamps are below if you would like to jump around. Let's go ahead and get right into it. So for an intuitive example, we're going to start with Bill. So here's Bill. Now Bill is risk averse. He's got some utility function. I'm not going to give him a specific utility function. The reason I'm not going to give him a specific utility function because the point of second order stochastic dominance is we want to determine which lottery any risk averse utility maximizer would pick over another. So the point is it's not going to be dependent on a specific utility function. It's just going to be if you're risk averse, this is the lottery you would pick over another lottery every single time, no matter your exact utility function. And so again, just to be risk averse, just means you have an increasing and concave utility function. So I'm just going to put that there. And let's think about this first example. So I've got two lotteries. I've got F and G. Again, you're asking Bill any risk averse utility maximizer, which lottery he would pick. And so he starts to look and he looks at L1, which we're eventually going to represent with CDFF. He says, okay, I've got a quarter chance of losing 20, a quarter chance of gaining 20, and a half chance of 10. Maybe I'll start off by thinking about what the expected value is. So I do my calculation, the 20s are going to cancel out, and I'm going to get an expected value of 5. And then we say, okay, let's think about L2, which is my other option. We're going to represent L2 with CDFG here in a second. But we notice that this lottery looks pretty similar to L1. The only difference is that instead of a risk of gaining 20 or losing 20, we're now at risk of losing 40 or gaining 40. But again, Maybe the expected value is different, so I'll just look at this first. I'll look at the expected value, and again, the 40s cancel out, and again, I'm left with an expected value of 5. So if you're Bill, if you're risk averse, you're looking at these two lotteries, which lottery would you pick? I personally am risk averse. I know that about myself, and I would definitely pick L1. That would be my preferred lottery if I had to choose which lottery to play. And again, second order stochastic dominance is just thinking about how can we formally explain that we know it to be intuitively true that a risk averse person should pick L1 over L2? And so second order stochastic dominance is going to be something about the risk of a given lottery because a risk averse person, if I've got two lotteries with the same expected value, I should pick the lottery that is less risky. And so what you might be thinking intuitively is, well, why is L1 less risky? Well, L1 is less risky because if I had to choose between a quarter chance of losing and gaining 20 and a quarter chance of losing or gaining 40, well, losing or gaining 20 sounds a lot less risky to me than losing or gaining 40. Even though I have a chance that I could win more money, I also have a chance of losing more money. And so it's less risky for me. The less risky option is to risk losing or gaining 20 compared to losing or gaining 40. And so now that we sort of intuitively have that down, Let's start talking about how we can formalize that, how we can use the CDFs, how we can use some mathematical concepts to prove that L1 is the less risky lottery. So similarly to first order stochastic dominance, we're going to use the CDFs to help us. And again, we're going to use F as the CDF for lottery one, which I'm going to draw in black, and G for the CDF of L2, which I'm going to show in that light bluish greenish color. So let's just get into it. And I know for F, for L1, I'm going to have a 25% chance of losing 20. And then at 10, I go up to a 75% chance. Again, this is one on a CDF. And then I go to a full 100% at 20. So I'm just going to draw this. My lines probably aren't going to be very straight. But you can imagine that these are supposed to be vertical and horizontal lines. And we're done, and I'm just going to call this F, and in parentheses, I'm going to say L1. Okay, and now we'll do the same thing with L2. And what we're going to notice is that for L2, we're going to start at 40. So there's 40. We're going to have the same thing going to happen at 10. 
And then of course it's gonna be slightly different because we've that 25% chance is gonna be 40. So I'll go ahead and go like this. And this will look sort of like this here. My drawing is not really to scale, so I'm gonna to have to draw some boxes so that we sort of tell which areas are supposed to be equal to each other. And again, this guy right here, this is gonna be G, and in parentheses, this is L2. Okay, so again, when we're talking about lotteries, you might think, well, it's easiest, can't, why can't we use FOSD? We've got a great video on first order stochastic dominance probably popping up in the right corner right about now. Feel free to save that and watch that after this video. But just to review really quickly, the reason why you can't use FOSD is because to put it in simplest terms, the CDFs cross. So what we have is we have down here, you can see that F is to the right of G, but over here, G is to the right of F, so we can't use FOSD. So maybe I'll just put that in the top corner. Maybe I'll just write that and I'll just say FOSD. I'll put a little X. And the reason we can't do that is because the CDFs cross. Just to put it in simplest terms, again, check out that video on FOSD if you want like a more in-depth explanation or review of first order stochastic dominance. Now, the other thing that I said is the areas need to be marked. The reason that is, is because if this is area A and this is area B, then remember that the area of A is actually equal to the area of B. I just can't draw because of course this box has a length of 20 and a height of 0.25. This box also has a width of 20 and a height of 0.25. I just can't draw. Okay, and the reason that's useful is because this is where the extra risk is coming from. Basically, we've taken F almost, and we've just said, okay, we're just going to make the possible bonus payoff or the positive payoff bigger, and the possible negative outcome even worse. And so we've just sort of made L1 more risky and so that shifting of the area to a higher and a lower payoff, we have a name for that. That's called an elementary increase in risk. So I'll just put that in here, just so you're aware of the term. It's not as useful in terms of determining SOSD, but it might come up in your class, and so this way you've heard it at least once. If you want a fuller video on what an elementary increase in risk is and how to sort of look at it, put a comment below. I'll see if there's enough interest, and if so, I'll make a video on it. Otherwise, I'm probably going to leave it at that. Now, let's start thinking about how we can use the CDF to show why Bill or any risk averse utility maximizer would prefer F over G. And it's going to happen based on the area under the curve. So what we're looking at is, let's suppose we look at F. So you're looking at F, and we're looking at the area under the curve. We got zero, then we have some positive area. And then we basically have this integral right here. And you can imagine that shape, which represents the area under the CDF. Now, if you compare the area under the curve of G, you can see, okay, it's the same. And now starting at about minus 40 and going all the way up to 20, you can see that the area under the curve for G for L2 is greater than the area under the curve of F. And so up until this point right here, well, you can see is that what we've got is we've got basically that the area under the curve, so that's the integral from zero to x, and we'll call that g of t, just to sort of have a different variable in the integration from x. You can see that what we've got is we've got g of t dt is greater, it's got a larger area under the curve for under g than for f, all the way up to 20. And then once we get to this point right here, now F is starting to catch up. The area under the curve is getting bigger under F than G, all the way until this point right here at which the areas are equal. But we know that this lottery F is still preferred to G for all utility maximizers because of the intuition that we talked about earlier. And so we just put a little equals here. So now what we're saying, the way you can tell if one lottery SOSD is another lottery is that what was happening is that for any X, for any cutoff you choose, the area under the curve for the one that's dominated has to be greater than or equal to the area under the curve for whichever lottery second order stochastically dominates the other. And I'll say that again, just to try and be a little clearer. If one lottery, so F SOSDs G, if F SOSDs G, then the area under the curve of F is always at least as small as, if not smaller, then the area under the curve for the other lottery, no matter where you stop the integration. And so that is where we have second order stochastic dominance. 
That's what second order stochastic dominance means. That's how you apply it. The one thing to note is that both lotteries need to have the same expected value. So maybe we'll just formalize that really quick. So if f and g, where remember f is representing L1, g is representing L2, if those two lotteries have the same mean, then what we're saying is that if f second order stochastically dominates g, the area under the CDF of g needs to be greater than or equal to the area under the curve of f for any cutoff for any x. That's what it means for second order stochastic dominance. Now, I mentioned earlier, I was also going to talk about mean preserving spread, and that's an implication of second order stochastic dominance. So if f second order stochastically dominates g, then that means that g is a mean preserving spread or an MPS of f. So a natural question is what does it mean to be a mean preserving spread? So a mean preserving spread just means what you're doing is you're keeping the same expected value, and you're just making the lottery riskier. So again, in our example, our original example, we had the expected value, which was 5, and G or L2 had the expected value of 5. But L2 was a riskier lottery than L1 because we took the same expected value and we just increased the variation of payoffs. And so it's not actually sufficient to just use variance to determine second order stochastic dominance. And again, that's a whole separate video. If you want to get into that, again, leave a comment below. But basically what we did to get L2 is we almost just took L1 and we spread out the possible payoffs so that it became a riskier lottery. So we kept the expected value the same and just made it riskier. I'm gonna give you another example in a second, but let's talk about the formal definition of a mean preserving spread. So a mean preserving spread just means if you have a lottery like L1, you can basically add some mean zero noise to that lottery and we're adding lottery. So this is gonna be sort of a convex combination of lotteries. Again, I think an example in a second will help you. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna get that second lottery by taking the first lottery and adding a mean zero lottery to it. And so let's just do an example. I think that's gonna be more helpful. So here's L1. L1, you've got a half chance of $2, half chance of $3. The mean of this guy is of course just gonna be, this is one, this is 1 1.5, so this is 2.5. And you wanna get to L2 where you have a quarter chance of one, two, three, and four. We're trying to say that L2 is a mean preserving spread of L1. What you can do is you can say, all right, well, L2 is going to have basically a mean, well, this is going to be 0.25. This is going to be 0.5. This is going to be 1 fourth of 4 is 1. And 1 fourth of 3, I'm going to determine in a second. But basically, you can see that what this is going to be, 1 fourth of 3 is actually 0.75. So what we're going to have is we're gonna have exactly 2.5. So first we've met the first criteria because this mean and this mean are equal. So how in the world do you get from L2 to L1? Well, you can add a lottery to it, L3. And what you can do is this is one half of one and one half of four. So you're like, what do you mean? This is also a mean of 2.5. And what you can say is that L2 is one half of L1 plus one half of L3. And so you can get to L2 by adding one half L3 and one half L1, which is just a convex combination of the two lotteries. And so you'll get the same mean, but more noise. We haven't changed the mean of L1, we've just increased the spread. And so because we're able to make L2 from a combination of L1 and another lottery, where we've kept the mean the same, we're gonna say that L2 is a mean preserving spread of L1, just like that. So again, if that's a little hazy, put some comments below, put some questions, I'll try and answer them the best I can, may result in a subsequent video, but hopefully this makes a lot of sense as to what a mean preserving spread is, and hopefully it just really helps you better understand second order stochastic dominance, which is just based on the area under the CDFs for two lotteries with the same expected value. So if you're finding these videos helpful, please like and subscribe. Please put a comment below if anything in particular is helpful or would be helpful. We'll see you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.